The title of the sermon this morning is, For Thine is the Kingdom. For Thine is the Kingdom. One of my favorite stories in the Bible about prayer is the story of Hannah. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the story of Hannah. I'm not going to quiz you on anything. Just Yeah, some of you heard the story. So Hannah was one of the many women in the Bible who was barren. She couldn't have children. And back then, this was a tragedy, believe it or not. Things have changed a lot. But back then, it was a tragedy. It was a disgrace. It was shameful. And she was teased and mocked and ridiculed because she was childless. And so more than anything in the world, she wanted a child. And so once a year, her family would take a trip to Shiloh, which is where um, people would worship at the time. That's where the altar was and the tabernacle. So once a year, her family would travel to, chi- travel to Shiloh to worship the Lord, offer a sacrifice. One year, whenever they went, she just opened up her heart to the Lord in prayer. And she said, Lord, more than anything else, I mean, she was weeping, the Bible says, she was crying. More than anything, Lord, I want a son. Give me my own son. And believe it or not, the Lord answered her prayer, opened up her womb, blessed her with a son. Now, she made a promise to the Lord. She said, Lord, if you will give me a son, then I'll dedicate him back to you. I'll give him back to you. So the Lord answered her prayer, gave her a son. And whenever she finished weaning him, she brought him back to the tabernacle. And she actually said, handed him over to the priest and said, Eli, I want him to stay here with you, live here with you. He's going to serve here with you. He's going to minister here with you at the temple. Well, the Lord blessed Hannah's faithfulness to follow through on her, her word. And he gave her three more sons and two more daughters. And Hannah named her son, anybody know? Samuel. And the reason why she named him Samuel, it means I requested him from the Lord. And that story illustrates the power of prayer. The word prayer just means a request. When you request something from the Lord, he is listening. He loves you. And prayer is powerful because God hears and he answers prayers. And so we're learning how to pray by studying the Lord's prayer. And uh, so let's recite it together. It should be on the screen for you. Hopefully. You see it? All right. If you know it, I, I encourage you to, to close your eyes and say it as a prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we've looked at every part of this prayer so far. We've looked at the preface, Our Father which art in heaven. Then we looked at all six of the petitions. And today we've made it to the conclusion. In verse 13, Matthew 6, 13. This is actually the second part of verse 13. It says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I don't know how many of you brought your Bibles, and if you're following along in your Bible, you may notice that the conclusion is not found in most modern Bible versions. That little conclusion is not found in most Bible translations. We are studying the Lord's Prayer out of the King James Version. Normally, I preach from the Christian Standard Bible. Um, but we're studying the Lord's Prayer, the King James Version, because that's the one that everybody knows. And that's the one that I encourage you to memorize because anytime you get together with a group of people at a funeral, at a wedding, any kind of a ceremony, any kind of a service, and they all quote the Lord's Prayer together, it's going to be the King James Version. But what's interesting is that it's not found, this conclusion is not found in most (coughs) modern Bible translations. And that's because the earliest and the most reliable Greek manuscripts that we have do not have the conclusion in the Lord's Prayer. It's not there. Now, let me explain that a little, a little bit further. So the King James Version is based on Greek manuscripts that were produced a thousand years after the book of Matthew was originally written. Let me say that again. The King James Version is based on Greek manuscripts that were produced a thousand years after Matthew was originally written. Well, ever since 1611, that's whenever the King James Version was published, ever since 1611, scholars, archaeologists, they have discovered a lot 
of old manuscripts, many of them way older than the ones that were used to produce the King James Version, many of them just a few hundred years after Matthew was originally written. And in general, the older the manuscript, the more reliable, the more trustworthy it is. And what they found is that the oldest and the most reliable manuscripts of the book of Matthew, they don't have this conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. And so that's why they don't include it in most modern Bible versions. Instead, it's believed that the early Christians, the early church, they tagged the conclusion on to the, to the end of the Lord's Prayer because it was, the, it was a Jewish custom to end their prayers in praise, in a word of prayers, with a, what's called a doxology, which is a statement or an ascription of praise and thanks. They would commonly do that. And so it's believed that the early Christians, they just kept this tradition and so as they stated the Lord's Prayer over and over again, eventually they added on a doxology, a word of praise, a statement of praise to the end of the Lord's Prayer, and it ended up getting included in Greek manuscripts over time of the book of Matthew. Now, even though this conclusion is not included in the original version, it's not unbiblical, and it's a still a very good thing to pray. It's still a very good thing to include in your prayer life. And so that's why we're going to study it this morning. I pray it, I encourage you to continue to pray it, but I wanted to tell you why it's not in your, your modern Bible translations. So scholars believe that it's probably the doxology here, the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer is probably coming from one of King David's prayers in the Old Testament. I want to show it to you. It's in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. Now, this is much longer than the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer, but I want you to notice the same ideas are coming forth from this prayer. So King David is praying, and he says, May you be blessed, Lord God our Father, of our Father Israel, from eternity to eternity. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty for everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. And you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. You see the similarities there, some of the same terminology? So as I mentioned, this conclusion is called a doxology. And a doxology is a statement or an ascription of praise and thanks to God. So that's what we find here at the end of the Lord's Prayer. As I said, it was customary for the Jews to do this with their prayers. At the end of their prayer, they would say a word of praise or thanks to the Lord. Christians probably picked up on this. You'll see this. I'm going to show you one of Paul's prayers in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. If you read the letters of Paul... In fact, all of the letters in the New Testament, you'll find prayers. So as they're writing these letters, included in their, in their letters will be pray, uh, prayers that they wrote down, that they're either praying for the people that they're writing to or, or for something else. But in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, you'll find one of Paul's prayers. And verses 14 through 19 are the prayer and then verses 20 through 21, the last two verses, it's a doxology. He stops praying for things, and now he's just praising the Lord. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm not, I'm not going to read the prayer in verses 14 through 19. I just want to read to you his doxology, his statement of praise. He says in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So what he's doing is he's praying and then he's ending his prayer with a doxology. And so you find that a lot in the Bible. And that's what we see here in the Lord's Prayer. Now remember that the Lord's Prayer is not just something to recite. The Lord's Prayer is instructing us in how to pray. So the fact that the Lord's Prayer ends in a doxology, what it's doing is it's instructing us that a good practice to get in, I told you we're going to have to expect that every week. A good practice to get in is to not only begin your prayers with praise, but to end your prayers with praise and thanks. That's what it's telling us to do here. And specifically, it's telling us here to praise God 
for three things, okay? So you can write these down. The first thing, we want to praise God for the kingdom. It says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For thine is the kingdom. So first thing we're doing is we're praising God for the kingdom. And, and whenever you say thine is the kingdom, that, that means three things. You're praising God for three things. First thing, you're saying to the Lord, you are the king of kings. When you say thine is the kingdom, you're saying you are the king of kings. You're in charge. You're the boss. You're the master. We see this in 1 Timothy 6.15. It says, God will bring this about in his own time. He's the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So when you say, for thine is the kingdom, you're saying, God, you are the king. You're the boss. You're in charge. I'm not. You're saying, God, you have the right to dictate every area of my life and everything that goes on in the universe. You have the right, you have the authority to be in charge. Now, why is that? Why does God have the right to be in charge of you? Why does God, yeah, why does God have the right? You know, what gives you the right? Why does God have the right to dictate your life? Let me give you five reasons. Number one, some of you already mouthed it to me. He made you. He created you. Colossians 1.16 says, For everything was created by him. All things have been created through him and for him. So the word authority comes from the word author. When you're the author of something, you have authority over it. God is your author. Therefore, he has authority over you. He has the, the right to make demands on your life. He's your authority. He made you. You come from him. The second reason that God has the right to be the king over your life, why he's in charge, is that he saved you. Not only did he make you, but he saved you through Jesus, through the cross. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, For you are, you are not your own, for you were bought at a high price. So glorify God with your body. That's talking to Christians, and it's saying, now that you're a Christian, you're not your own. You were bought with a high price. You were in slavery to sin and Satan and death, and God bought you with the blood of Jesus Christ. Without Christ, you would be headed for God's eternal wrath. The only reason why you are here today and why you're saved and why you're heaven bound is because of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he has the right to be in charge of you. He deserves your obedience. Third, God sustains you. God sustains you. Colossians 1.17 says, he is before all things, talking about Jesus. He's before all things and by him, all things hold together. So deists, it's a particular deism, it's a particular religion that, that believes that God essentially created the universe, created the earth, created people, and then he just steps back. And now just nature just goes on its own. It's like God wound up a clock or a watch, and now he's just stepping back. And now the earth and humanity and nature, it's just going on its own. That's not the picture the Bible presents, actually. The Bible presents the picture that God is intimately involved with his creation, and he is the one who is keeping it going. He's the one who's keeping the sun turning and the moon from crashing into the earth. He's the one who's keeping your heart beating and your blood pumping and your, your lungs working and your immune system functioning. He's the one keeping that all going, is what the Bible says. And so God is keeping you alive right now. Every breath is a gift from him, and he has the power to stop that right now, to snuff out your life right now, and you don't even deserve to be alive. He's doing this all by his free grace. And so because he is sustaining your very life this moment, he deserves your obedience. Third, third reason why God has the right to be in charge is every good thing comes from God, the Bible says. Every good thing in your life is a gift from God. I love this verse in James 1.17. It says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. So what that's saying is that every good thing that you have in your life comes from him. So your intellect, 
your health, your talents, your skills, your job, your income, your family, your marriage, your friendships, your car, your education, all of these things are undeserved gifts from God. Everything comes from him. And he could take it away in an instant. And again, all of these things are undeserved. So surely if God has given us so much, he deserves our obedience. And then a fifth reason that God has the right to be in charge of you is that we're his children. We're his children. He is our father. 1 Peter 1.14 tells us, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. So if God is our heavenly father, he deserves our obedience. We should obey him and honor him. So whenever we say, thine is the kingdom, we're saying, Lord, you are the king of kings. You are in charge. You're the boss. But the second thing you're saying when you say, thine is the kingdom, is you're saying, Lord, I commit to submit to you. Not only, see, first, you're acknowledging he is in charge. He's the king, I'm not. But the second thing you're saying is you're going you're to go ahead and submit to that. You're going to say, Lord, I am making a conscious decision to obey you, to treat you as the king. I acknowledge you that, that, you're, that you're in charge, but I'm not going to live in rebellion anymore. From now on, I submit to your rule. John 6.38 tells us this is what Jesus did. Jesus said this, he said, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's what you're saying. For thine is the king. And Lord, you're in charge. You're the king. And I'm going to submit to your rule. The third thing you're saying when you say thine is the kingdom is you're saying, Lord, you have the right to answer my petitions as you see fit. You have the right to answer my petitions as you see fit because you're in charge. You're the king. You have all authority. R.T. Kendall put it this way. He said, it is also to honor, praying this prayer, this conclusion, this doxology, he says, it is also to honor and accept his verdict regarding our own inheritance in the kingdom. To say yours is the kingdom is to stop snapping our fingers at God and expect him to act at our command. Prayer is, does not put you in charge. Prayer does not make you the boss of God. Prayer is not a spiritual vending machine. A vending machine is like a Coke machine or a snack machine. When you put a, a, a dollar in, you deserve to get a dollar's worth of whatever you're paying for. Prayer is not that way. With prayer, we make a request of God who is in charge. We're saying, God, if it's your will and in your timing and in your way, please answer this request. And so when you say, thine is the kingdom, you're saying, Lord, you're the king, and I submit to you, and Lord, you have the right to answer my requests. Because listen, this is at the end of the Lord's prayer. So you've already made all these requests, and now you're saying, and thine is the kingdom. You have the power, or you have the right and the authority to answer my prayer however you want. So that's the kingdom. We're praising God for thine is the kingdom. The second thing, we're praising God for his power. It says in Matthew 6, 13, for thine is the kingdom and the power. The power. So you've already prayed. You've already made all your requests. You've presented your request to the Lord. It's wonderful to end your prayer by praising God that he has the ability to answer your prayer. You're praising God for, Lord, you have the power to do everything I just asked you to do and more. That's what you're doing here. Let me give you a quick Greek lesson. There are two Greek words in the New Testament that are both sometimes translated with the English word power. Two Greek words. The first one is exousia. Exousia. And exousia refers to authority. That refer, it refers to the right to do something. That refers to exactly what we just talked about. For thine is the kingdom. You have the right, you have the authority to make demands on my life, to answer my prayer request however you want to. You have the right, you have the authority, you have the authority, you are in charge, you are the king. That's exousia. We see that word in the Great Commission. Look at the, the screen, Matthew 28, 18. 
This is the beginning of the Great Commission. Jesus said this right before he ascended into heaven, after he rose from the grave. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That, that, that word authority is the Greek word exousia. It's the right, it's the authority to be in charge. And that, that's what Jesus was saying. God the Father has given me all authority to be King of kings and Lord of lords, to be in charge. That's not the word we see here in the Lord's Supper. The Greek word, uh, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Prayer. The Greek word that we see here in the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the power, is the word dunamis. Dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S, dunamis. And it's where we get our, Greek word, our English word dynamite. Dunamis. Dunamis is the ability to do something. It's the ability to do something. It's the, the ability to make something happen. So if you have the power to bench press 300 pounds, that means you have the ability to bench press 300 pounds. You have the, the ability to make that happen. And so whenever we say thine is the power, we're not just saying, God, you have the right and the authority to be in charge of my life and to answer my prayers however you want. We're saying, God, you have the power to do anything that I've asked and more, the ability to do anything that I've asked and more, the dunamis. So theologians call this attribute of God his omnipotence. Omnipotence, that comes from two words. Omni means all. Potence means powerful. God is all powerful. He can do anything. Now, specifically speaking, technically speaking, because some of you like to be technical, God's omnipotence doesn't mean that he can actually do anything. There are some things that God cannot do. For example, God cannot lie. God cannot destroy himself. God can't make a rock so big that he can't then come and move it. God can't create a square circle. There are some things that God cannot do. God, when we say that God can do anything, what we mean is that God can do anything that conforms to his will and character. God can do anything that conforms to his will and his character. Job 42.2 says, I know that you can do anything and no plan of yours can be thwarted. One time, Jesus told his disciples that it's difficult for a rich person to get saved and go to heaven. He said, it's so difficult, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get saved. And so his disciples said, well, Lord, who can be saved? Then who can be saved? And Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's what we mean when we say, for thine is the power. God has the ability to do anything. And the amazing thing is that God has promised this power to us through the Holy Spirit. He's promised to give us access to this omnipotence through the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul acknowledged this when he said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us as Christians, God empowers us and gives us power to do his will. And so to say, thine is the power, you're praising God after you've prayed for all, made all these requests, you're praising God. He has the power, the ability to answer our prayers, to do anything that we ask. And then third, the third thing that we're praising God for is the glory. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. So to understand this part of the conclusion, we need to ask two questions. First of all, what is the glory of God? And second, what does it mean to glorify God? What is the glory of God when it says, thine is the glory? The glory of God is the display of his attributes. The glory of God is the display of his attributes. And so whenever we see God's love on the cross, whenever we see God's power in nature, whenever we see God's wisdom in scripture, we are seeing God's glory. We are seeing God's attributes on display. That's his glory. Now, what does it mean to glorify God? The Bible commands us, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. What does it mean to glorify God? 
To glorify God is to respond to his glory and to reflect his glory. It's to respond and reflect. Let me explain those two. First of all, to glorify God is to respond to his glory by praising and adoring and thanking him for his attributes. So in scripture, sometimes the word glorify is substituted for the word praise. So glorify the Lord. Sometimes that's talking about praise the Lord. We're responding to his glory by praising him and by giving him thanks. Also to glorify God is to respond to his glory by giving him the credit for anything good in your life, for any answered prayer requests. So to glorify God is to respond to his glory by praising and thanking. To glorify God is also to reflect his glory to those around us to reflect his glory. How do you reflect like a mirror the glory of God? By imitating his moral attributes. That's what God wants you to do, to glorify him by imitating his moral attributes. What are God's moral attributes? He's holy and he's pure. He's without sin. He's pure. He's loving and gracious and merciful and kind and generous and forgiving and on and on. His moral attributes To glorify him is to reflect those moral attributes in your life, in your character. And what you're doing is you're showing the world how awesome God is and how awesome it is to be a child of God. So you're glorifying God. So to glorify God is to respond to his glory and to reflect his glory. Whenever we say, for thine is the glory, we're praising God for his attributes We're giving him credit for everything good in our lives. And we're making a commitment to reflect his glory. We're making a commitment to glorify him. For thine is the glory. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. A quick review. The conclusion to the Lord's Prayer is a doxology. It's a statement of praise and of thanksgiving. And so what it's doing here is it's it's instructing us Whenever you end your prayers, end, you don't have to do this uh, uh, every single time legalistically, but it's a good practice to try to end your prayers in praise and thanksgiving. And specifically, it's instructing us to praise God for three things. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. When we say thine is the kingdom, we're praising God's kingship. We're saying, God, you are king. We submit to your rule And you can answer our prayers any way you want to. Whenever we say, thine is the power, we're praising God for his omnipotence. We're saying, God, you can do anything. Anything that we've prayed for, we just praise you because you're big enough to answer our prayers. And when we say, thine is the glory, we're praising God for his attributes. And we're making a commitment. Lord, we're going to reflect your moral attributes in our lives. We're going to glorify you by the way that we live. So, That's not the end, though, of the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer doesn't just teach us how to pray. It teaches us how to end our prayers. What's the very last word of the Lord's Prayer? Amen. Yes. And so what does amen mean? It says in Matthew 6, 13, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're instructed to end our prayers with the word amen. Amen can be used in two different ways. For some of you, this is, this is old news. For, for others of you, you hear people saying amen all the time, and you're like, what does that even mean? All right, here's what it means. Amen, first of all, can be used as an affirmation that something is true. An affirmation that something is true. So when the preacher says something that you agree with, you can say amen. Amen. You can say it out loud. Amen. And that's an affirmation. What he just said, that's true. All right? I should hear a few of those because hopefully I'm not saying anything that's wrong or false, but I should hear a few of those every Sunday. So that's the first thing. Whenever you're praying along with other people and the person who's praying out loud, you're praying silently along with them. And when they say something that's true, when they say, God, America needs revival, you can say, amen. That's true. So anytime somebody's praying, you can agree with them in prayer. You say, amen. Now, the second thing, the word amen is also a desire that something will happen. 
It's an affirmation that something is true. It's a desire. It's an expression of your desire for something to happen. So whenever you end your prayer with amen, it's like you're saying, and Lord, I really meant that. Like, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Amen. I I really mean it, Lord. Remember, we're to pray with sincerity when we pray. And this is, this is when you're saying amen, this is what you're saying is, I'm really sincere. I really mean this prayer. When somebody else is praying out loud and you're praying along silently and they finish their prayer and they say, amen, you can say amen. And when you do that, you're expressing your desire for what they just prayed to happen as well. You're saying, I agree with them. I want that to happen too. So amen is a powerful word. It's an affirmation that something is true. It's a desire that something will happen. Now, of course, most Christians don't just end their prayers with amen. We say, in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen, because Jesus commanded us to pray in his name, which what we're doing is we're acknowledging that the only reason why we have access to God the Father is through the atonement of Jesus Christ, because of what he's done for us on the cross. So that's why we say, in Jesus, the only reason, God, I can come boldly before your throne, the only reason why you're listening to me, a sinner, is because I'm coming through the blood of Jesus. And so that's why we say, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, before we close, before we close out this study on the Lord's Prayer, let's do a quick review. I'm going to give you 10 points. Quick, this is real quick, all right? It's not going to take another hour, another 30 minutes. 10 quick points. What what have we learned in the Lord's Prayer? First of all, remember that we're commanded to pray the Lord's Prayer. Jesus began in Matthew 6, 9 by saying, therefore, you should pray like this. Remember, we're commanded to pray the Lord's Prayer. Don't let the Lord's Prayer uh, drift out of your mind and just not think about it anymore until the next time, five, five, ten years down the road, we'll do another sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. And they're like, oh yeah, I forgot about the Lord's Prayer. No, we're supposed to pray it. Second, Remember that the Lord's Prayer can be used for recitation and reference. Two ways. In other words, it can be used for recitation. You can recite it. Several of you have told me that you've recited it, that you recite it regularly. Somebody in our church said, told me that she likes to recite the Lord's Prayer every night before bed. Another person said recently they were going through a kind of a family crisis and she was just at a loss, didn't even know what to pray. So she just prayed the Lord's Prayer, recited the Lord's Prayer. So I think as a church, once or twice a month, when we gather on Sundays, we're going to start reciting the Lord's Prayer together. That's going to be a practice that we're going to adopt. I love, you know, that's one of the ways that I've grown just by going through this. I've, I've noticed, you know what, we need to be praying the Lord's Prayer together. So you should recite it, but we're also to use it as a reference. The Lord's Prayer teaches us the kinds of requests and petitions that we're to make so that we make sure that we're praying according to God's will. And so the Lord's Prayer is an outline that we're to fill in. It's a skeleton that we're to clothe. Third, the preface to the Lord's Prayer teaches us to see God correctly. The preface is our Father, which art in heaven. It's so important as we're beginning the prayer to see God correctly. We see God as our Father. That means that he loves us and that no request that we can make is too small or insignificant for him. He cares about it. If you care about it, he cares about it. But then whenever we say our Father in heaven, we're reminded that God is almighty, that he's huge, he's amazing, and that no prayer request is too big. No problem is too great. Fourth, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name is a request. It's not a statement. It's you're praying for something. You're asking for something when you say hallowed be thy name. And it's a request for God to be seen for who he truly is and treated accordingly. It's for God to be seen for who he truly is and to be treated accordingly. Literally, literally, it means, may your name be honored as holy. But what we're praying is, Lord, I pray that I and everybody around me would see you for who you truly are. Because God's name refers to his character. See you for who you truly are and treat you the way that you deserve. Fifth, Thy kingdom come is a request for more and more people to accept Jesus Christ as the king. God sent his Messiah to earth 
with the incarnation when Jesus Christ came as a baby and he grew up and, and he had a ministry for three years. Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of God. And yet most people do not accept Jesus as the Savior, of, as God's Messiah that he sent. So to pray, thine, thy kingdom come, we're saying, Lord, I pray that more and more people, it's a prayer for evangelism, world evangelization, that more and more people will accept Jesus Christ as the King, as the Messiah that you sent. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Sixth, thy will be done is a request for us to be more and more obedient to God. Lord, help me and my family and my church become more and more obedient. Seventh, give us this day our daily bread. It's a request for God to, to supply all of our material needs. Remember, it's a figure of speech called a synecdoche, where a part represents the whole. Jesus isn't saying you can only ask for bread. It's a synecdoche. It represents all of your material needs. Lord, give me, please supply all of my material needs. Eighth, forgive us as we forgive is a request for God to forgive our sins. And it's a commitment to forgive everybody who wrongs us. Ninth, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, is a request for God to help us stay away from temptation. But then also, it's a prayer for God to help us overcome the temptations that we have to face. Lord, keep me out of temptation if possible. But, when, but if I have to face temptation, Lord, help me overcome it. And then 10th, the conclusion is a doxology. It's a statement or a scription of praise. It teaches us to end our prayers by praising the Lord, by thanking the Lord. So let's pray right now, and we're going to close in a song. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for teaching us through the Lord's Prayer, for giving us the Lord's Prayer, for giving us a prayer that is guaranteed to work as long as we pray it with sincerity, because we know that every request in the Lord's Prayer is your will, Father, we pray that you would help us to take all that we've learned in this sermon series and, and, Lord, not just know more, but pray more and to pray more effectively. Father, I pray that you would help me to become a prayer warrior and that our church would be filled with prayer warriors, people who are just devoted to prayer, and that we would be a praying church. <coughs> we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.